there now we go can did y'all see my screen switch just making sure yes we see that beautiful Please. picture all right yeah <laughs> had, to, had to switch it up on you so just in case y'all think y'all getting the same um presentations had to switch up a picture on y'all be fabulous <laughs> But again, my name is Lysandra Everett, and I am really delighted to be here to be a part of this. I am the founder of Everett Tax Solutions, ETS Tax Relief, and ETS Tax Institute. And somebody asked me on the last um, last class, why did I have them both? And you know, the tax solutions, which does the tax prep and tax relief separate, that was just a preference of mine. So that if I wanted to sell one, sell them all, do whatever. I have more choices in that. That's all that was. So, okay. Um, but anyway, I've been an enrolled agent since 2017. I'm currently the president of the Virginia Society of Enrolled Agents. There's all the memberships and things and all the other stuff I do. And all that reads tax geek. That's all you got to know. <laughs> all right. Okay, so we're going to be talking about business retirement plans today. And even though this is really focused on, um, you know, passing the EA exam, giving you a little bit of knowledge here, you also need to take this knowledge and apply it to yourselves. Because there are a lot of people who do not think about the exiting end of the business. Like, what are you going to do when you're ready to take your toys and go home? How are you planning for these things? So you need to be looking at not only for the education to pass this exam, but also how are you going to implement this for yourselves, okay? All right, so today's agenda, we're going to be talking about um, qualified retirement plans, qualified plan rules. We're going to review the retirement plans and the key rules for each, the reporting requirements. We're going to dabble in um, prohibited transactions and what's the difference between, okay? So there is absolutely no way that I could like fully educate you on retirement plans in less than an hour. That's not going to happen. But this is just the stuff that you need to know that, you know, to help you pass the exam. Okay. So first of all, let's talk about what is a qualified retirement plan. These are plans that actually qualify for favorable tax benefits, such as um, a tax deferral on contributions, investment gains, and earning earnings. The employer-sponsored um, retirement plan qualifies you for special tax treatment under Section 401A. Now, you know the 401, you, you, when you hear like a 401K plan, that's the Section 401, okay? So employers can deduct contributions made to the plan for employees, and contributions to the plan are generally tax-free until distributed at retirement. Then there's the um, defined contribution plan. Now, with defined contribution plans, there is an individual account for each participant in the plan, okay? And then there's profit sharing, which the employer can decide how much they're going to contribute to the plan. Um, there is, you know, math that goes along with that. Um, I you know, many moons ago, I worked at a trucking company to where they had a profit sharing plan. You were building your um, your vested amount and then you became fully vested after five years. And so when I walked away from that job after eight years, I had a nice chunk of change when I left there because they had this profit sharing plan. And then there's the money purchase pension plan, which contributions to these plans are fixed and are not based on profits. And I've actually never really seen one of those um, where I knew what that was, to be, to be quite honest with you. Okay, and then there's a defined benefit plan. Sorry about that typo, uh, <laughs> it just stuck out to me now. But a defined benefit plan is one that is not a defined contribution plan. Generally defined um, benefit plans are there, the contributions are based on what is needed to provide the determined benefits to the plan um, participants. So that's the defined benefit plan. Let's talk about the rules because as with anything with the government, there is rules, right? Okay, so for a retirement plan to qualify for tax benefits, they've got to meet certain rules 
to do it. So one, the plan must be written. That sounds easy enough, right? And then the, the employer has to use plant assets only for the benefit of employees or their beneficiaries. So if you've ever been watching the news, you hear about people who have been contributing to what they thought was their retirement plan. And then there are people on the other end who are stealing their money to use to buy planes and cars and all these things, right? Not only is it stealing, but it's just against the law. So you can only use these plans specifically for the employees and their beneficiary. Now, the plan has to cover at least, and this is where tax law gets confusing because it's the lesser of 50 employees or the greater of 40% of all employees or two employees. If there's only one, then the plan must benefit that one employee, right? So you've got to look at all of these things. You have to look at first, do you have 50 employees? Or if you do, what's, what's greater, 40% of all employees or two employees, right? So you might not have 50, but if you have 35, then 40% of all employees. So you have to uh, make those plan comparisons. This is why retirement planning is a whole thing unto itself. Okay, so contributions. Okay, we have a polling question. So the polling question says, a qualified plan must meet certain requirements. Which of the following is not a requirement of a qualified plan? Minimum coverage requirements must be met. The plan must make it impossible for its assets to be used for or diverted to purposes other than for the benefit of the employees and their beneficiaries. Contributions or benefits must not discriminate in favor of highly compensated employees. The plan cannot provide for payment of retirement benefits before the normal retirement age. Which one of these is not a requirement of a qualified plan. So let's talk about the process of elimination, okay? So right now on your screen, you see contributions or benefits must not discriminate in favor of highly compensated employees. So we know that's not the right answer because that is a, um, a requirement, okay? Minimum coverage requirements must be met. Well, that's a question mark. The plan must make it impossible for assets to be used or diverted to purposes other than for the benefit of the employees and their beneficiaries. Well, we just learned that they can't do that. So we can mark that one off, right? So at this point, you're thinking, okay, even if you don't know for sure, you at least got a 50-50 shot right now right? So then the plan cannot provide for minimum, provide for payment of retirement benefits before the normal retirement age. Hmm. How does that sound to you? Right? And then minimum coverage requirements must be met. So Melinda, how did everybody answer? Uh, we got some with A and one answered correctly and some with C. Okay. And, and four people only participated. So we need y'all to, to participate. You got to participate be, to learn. <laughs> pick something. You're not going to, you know, nobody's coming to your house if you get it wrong, but at least guess. <laughs> I forgot. So what was the right answer? I forgot all the answers already. It was D. <laughs> um, the plan cannot provide for payment of retirement benefits before the normal retirement age. So, but, but the point in going through this exercise is that, you know, like Melinda said, it's going through the process of eliminations. If you know what the rules are, then you can 
immediately disqualify those answers. So even if you're like, eh, I don't know, you at least got a better shot of getting it right if you can eliminate some of those answers, if you even if you don't know for sure. Okay, so contributions cannot discriminate in, in favor of highly compensated employees. Think about all of these CEOs that you hear about, right? Like all of these um, highly paid CEOs. So you're the plan can't, you know, benefit them more than it would benefit anybody else. And so they must meet minimum vesting standards. So in general, they've got to be at least 21 or have at least one year of service, right? Um, and so then the requirement becomes two years if the plan is not a 401k plan, the minimum of, of two years of service. And that after not more than two years, the employee has a non-forfeitable right to all accrued benefits. Okay, so again, that non-forfeitable right, that means that after that vesting period, the money is mine. So like the company that I worked at several years ago, they had a five-year vesting period. So after that five years, at five years in one day, I could have left with whatever money was mine. And there was nothing that they could do about it. All right, and 401k plans must also cover part-time employees with at least 500 hours of service for three consecutive years. Now, this is actually fairly new um, because what's happening now, there is a shift in making retirement plans accessible to more people because previously folks weren't able to... Um, to really save for retirement through their jobs. And so now that, and that's really the root of all of this is allowing more people to be able to save um, for their retirement. Military spouses, for instance, of course, which I am one, so that is near and dear to my heart. One of the things that was very difficult for military spouses is that we're never in one place long enough, right? And so saving for retirement and even being a part of these vesting plans isn't wasn't going to happen because we were never in one place long enough. And so now there are, are credits in place for people who actually have plans for military spouses so that military spouses can actually still save for their retirement while we're on the move. So that's some extra stuff y'all need to know, but I had to say it. Okay. So now the employer can elect to exclude these part-time employees um, under the non-discrimination and coverage rules and from the application of top heavy rules. So yes, there are some exclusions available, but the fact is at least they even have these uh, plans available now. All right, so now let's talk about the types of retirement plans. Okay, polling question. IRA distributions made before 59 and a half are subject to blank as well as blank. So you got to fill in the blank. They are subject to blank as well as a blank. Okay. And answer the question, even if you don't think you're going to get it right. And I was trying to figure out how to do the blank. <laughs> so I don't, I, I think I'll be able to see everybody's answer after I end the poll. I hope so. If not, I'll get y'all to type y'all answers in the chat. Who knows the answer? Somebody jump on and say the two answers. Not Karen. Karen. Not Karen, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Karen okay. be on it. She be ready. <laughs> I want to pass this test. <laughs> you are going to pass it. You Karen are. Said she ain't got time for this discrimination. I'm telling you. <laughs> Who else knows the answer? Somebody tell us the answer. Taxability. 
What what did she yeah. say? Is it Jayanti or is it, yeah. is it Jay Silent? Jay, yeah, I go by Jay. <laughs> Jay, okay. She said penalty uh, and tax. Yes, tax and penalty. Taxation and penalties. Yes, which which is yep, that's right. Good job. Who was that? Jay. Jay. Jay, awesome. Thank you so much. Everybody, it's taxation and penalties. All right. So next up, we're going to do a quick review of the retirement plans. So we're going to cover a SEP, a simple IRA, simple 401k, a qualified con a defined contribution plan, and a qualified defined benefit plan. All right, SEP. How many of you all heard that SEP is a self-employed? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you call it? Self-employed retirement plan. No, SEP is Simplified Employee Pension Plan. That is what SEP stands for. And so these are the things that you have to know. First of all, the max contribution, the smaller of $66,000 or 25% of the participant's compensation. And then the max deduction is 25% of all the participants' compensation. The deadline for contribution is the due date of the employer's return, including extensions. And to set up the plan is any time up to the due date of the employer's return, including extensions. So you think about in your practice and you hear it all the time. People are like, oh my God, what could I do to save the money on these taxes? Okay, well, you could open a SEP. Okay, so people run and open a SEP and throw a little bit of money in there. Then they realize it's not a dollar for dollar reduction of their tax bill. Then they're like, okay, well, maybe not. <laughs> All right. So, you know, one of the things that I advise my clients is that saving for retirement is just that saving for retirement. The tax benefit is the bonus, not the reason. So these are the things that we have to just explain to our clients. So that's the, the short version of the SEP. Okay, there's a simple IRA and a simple 401k, okay? So simple, savings incentive match plan for employees. That is what simple is for. Our government is fantastic with all of these acronyms. Okay, so the max contribution for the employee is $15,500 plus um, $3,500 catch-up contributions for 50 year, for people who are 50 years and older, okay? Don't forget the catch-up piece for your 50-plus people when you're dealing with these re retirement plans because a lot of them don't know. They just know the, um, the base contribution. Now, the employer contribution is that dollar for, if they're doing a dollar for dollar, that match, it's up to 3%. Or if they're doing a fixed contribution, it's 2% um, of the compensation of the employee. And then the max deduction is the same as the, con the uh, contribution amount. The last day for contribution, if they're doing a salary reduction, if you're um, you know, doing that pre-tax contribution, 30 days after the end of the month. So within 30 days, that contribution needs to be made. If they're doing the um, matching and the non-elective, it's due, uh, the due date of the employer's return plus the extension time. So, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about extensions, but extensions really are your friend. <laughs> and if for nothing else, it's things like this, right? Because it gives you a little bit more time because um, that first you know, four months in the year, as you can see, it goes by on jet fuel. And a lot of people, especially with these larger businesses, getting those books together, those end of year books takes a lot more time than that. So, you know, filing those extensions and you, if you're a business owner, guess what? You're an employer too. Okay. So understanding what those extensions are for. All right. The setup, if you are the, you know, an existing employer, meaning that you've already been in business and you had no, pre no previous plan in place, then it has to be set up no later than October 1st of the calendar year. Now, if you're a new employer that was formed after October 1st, 
then you do it as soon as possible. So those are the, the deadlines. All right, we got our next poll. P. Diddy is self-employed, not for much longer. He is a calendar year taxpayer. If he wants to set up a SEP plan for his business for the year 2023, he must do so by, including extensions, October 15th, 2024, April 15th, 2024, January 31st, 2024, or December 31st, 2023. This is definitely a trick question. <laughs> and it's tricking some of y'all. <laughs> okay, let me hush. The correct answer is A, October 15th. Okay, so now due date plus extensions. So the 2023 tax return is due April 15th, 2024, right? So if you are on a calendar year, if you are a C corporation, if you are a single member LLC, then your due date is April 15th. Your extension date is October 15th, right? So the, know your extension dates. And nine times out of 10, that's kind of question is going to be. <laughs> it's going to be that individual that's self-employed, right? And so the the self-employed individual is uh, is 99 times out of 100 on a calendar year i don't even know an individual that is on a fiscal year i don't know why you would do that to yourself but it is what it is um so yeah so just knowing those deadlines okay defined contribution plan these are your 401ks your 403bs stock plans profit sharing plans so the max contribution for elective deferral is up to $22,500, and there's an additional $7,500 allowed for catch-up contributions for taxpayers over 50, age 50 and over, okay? And for the employer, it's the smaller of $66,000 or 100% of the participant's compensation. The max deduction is the 25% of all participants uh, compensation plus the amount of elective deferrals made. And then the, the max compensation limit for 2023 is $330,000. Now, I don't know if that type of thing is going to be on the exam, if they're going to say like for this defined contribution plan, what's the maximum um, compensation that be considered, but for 2023 is 330,000. Um, and the deadline for the, uh, for contribution for elective deferral is the due date of the employer's return, including extensions. And for the employer is the due date of the employer's return. And then for setup, it's any time up to the due date of the employer's return, including extensions. All right, so, oh Lord, I got the an employee. So, Lysandra's only employee, Manny Sales, earned 150000 in 2023. What is the max contribution Lysandra can make to his SEP IRA in one year?
All right, all right, all right. How we doing? Okay, so the majority of the people answered 37. How many people answered? Let me ask that question. <laughs> we we got 11 people that time. All right, that's <laughs> awesome. Okay, so who wants to tell me the right answer and why? I put it in the chat already. Oh. I shouldn't sure. have put it in there yet. <laughs> I think the the sixty six thousand trip some people love. They right. didn't the lesser of explain that to them, Lissandra. Right. So it's the the lesser, and generally speaking, anything with the IRS where you get a benefit, it's gonna be the lesser of for the most part. There are a few exceptions to that. So you have to look at them both, right? You have to look at the sixty six thousand and twenty five percent of the of the net earnings. OK, so if the 25 percent is lesser, then you use that number. If the 66,000 is lesser, then you use that number. In this case, he had 150,000. You multiply that by 25 percent. That's 37,500. Comparing that to 66,000, because it's the lesser of the two, you get the 37,500. Okay. All right. How are we doing on time? Okay. We're good. 1236. Okay. All right. So defined benefit plan, that is a pension. Okay. And if you notice in today's times, pensions are going away. Right. Um, so the max contribution is whatever the amount is needed to provide the annual benefit, no larger than the smaller of 265,000 or 100% of the participants' average compensation for their highest three consecutive calendar years. The max deduction is based on actuarial assumptions and computations. Do not ask me about that math. I don't think they'll ask you about that math. That's why they have actuaries, and we that ain't what we do. Okay, and so the last date of the contribution must be paid in quarterly installments depending on the plan year do 15 days at the end of each quarter. And the setup is any time up to the due date of the employer's return, including extensions. So as you can see, the majority of the answers for these setups is the due date of the employer's return, including extensions, except one, right? So you think about that. When, when you're answering these questions, if there's a question about when you know when's the deadline to set up these plans for the most part is before the return is due including extensions okay now all of that we went through is in this fabulous chart right so depending on how you learn you learn the chart or you go through each one you just figure out how you learn best okay so there's this fabulous chart that will be in your um, in your fast forward materials. These charts are fantastic, especially to have on your desk during tax time, because people contributing to their retirement accounts are going to be asking you, hey, how much can I put away? And you're like, hold on, let me do this math real fast. And also knowing what kind of retirement plan your client has, because a lot of times your client does not know what type of retirement plan that they have. They just call their financial advisor and set up a retirement plan. And like, I had a client this season, I said, what type of plan do you have? I have a self-employed retirement plan. I'm like, there's lots of those. What kind do you have? So originally she told me it was a SEP. Turns out she had a 401k. So her contribution amounts were different, right? So they got to know. And sometimes it's like, just can you just send me the paperwork so I can read it? All right. So you have this fabulous chart. OK. And you can also find there are a lot of people, a lot of um, retirement plan companies that produce these charts that go that have all of the things in there, too. So that, those are good resources as well. All right. So let's talk about reporting requirements. All right. 
Question, Leffy Teffy, age 50, withdrew $10,000 from his IRA to pay for the graduate school expenses for his son. His son's educational expenses were $10,000 and he received a $2,000 scholarship from the university. Thank you, university. What amount of the withdrawal from the IRA is subject to early withdrawal? Is it zero? Is it 10,000? Is it 2,000? Is it 8,000? What you think? What you think? If you answer 10,000, chime in and tell me why why you answer 10,000. He's under the age of 59. Oh, okay, I see what you did. Mm -hmm. Four people answered 10,000. Somebody else chime in and tell me why you answered 10,000. If you answer 2,000, tell me why you answered 2,000. Nobody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, scared the people. <laughs> I put mine in the chat because I'm actually in a noisy spot. Let me see. Tanya said the... um. Who, who was that? This was Sharon. Sharon, Sharon yeah. said, which did you answer 2,000 or 10,000? I answered 10 and I said 10 because that's what was withdrew. But then okay. I started second guessing. <laughs> okay. Due to the scholarship amount. I said zero. I said zero because isn't that one of the things they can do? Um, withdraw for a dependent's grad? Um, college expenses. <laughs> oh no, you tell me. <laughs> oh, oh, it's a graduate. It's a graduate school expense. So that might be the tricky part there. I think being an undergraduate has is. Um... <sighs> okay, so the answer is C. You want to tell them why, Alessandra? You want me to tell them why? Oh, you go ahead. No, All say, right, what? so. The ten percent, the ten percent early withdrawal tax will not apply to distributions from an IRA if the taxpayer uses the amounts to pay qualified higher education expenses. It doesn't matter if it's graduate or not. That's that's a okay. trick question for okay. you all. <laughs> um, but it has to be the taxpayer, the taxpayer spouse, the child, or the grandchild. Um, the committee report clearly states that the qualified higher education expenses include those related to the graduate level courses. So don't let graduate courses throw you off. Um, the amount of the qualified higher education expenses is reduced by the amount of any qualified scholarship, um, which is the educational assistance. So it's the two thousand um dollars not the ten thousand everybody understand that more tax law more tax law and so the, the other thing about retirement plans is that every retirement plan has their own rules Right. And then as you start to really learn about retirement plans, there are retirement plans that you can take loans from. There are retirement plans that have certain um, 
distribution rules, right? Where even with the early withdrawal for like home ownership, um, and I want to say the IRS has a really cool chart with the exceptions. Um, and I don't know why I just thought about that when I was, <laughs> when I didn't think about it last night. But they do. I, I actually have a link. I'm going to send it. I'll post it okay. after the, um, after you're done. Yeah. So, okay. All right, cool. Let's cruise along. We're almost done. Okay. So let's talk about reporting requirements. Okay. So the annual re return is due by the last day of the seventh month after the planned year ends. Okay, so most people are on a calendar year. So the seventh month is July. So that's July 31st. And you have three types of 55, form 5500s. That's the SF, which is a simplified form. The EZ, which is generally what the one, pr one participant plan um, only. And then the form 5500 for um, for plans that you can't use a simplified form or the EZ form. Um, now, when forming these, your retirement plans and calling these institutions that manage these plans, you need to ask who files the form 5500. Because for smaller plans, unless you ask, they're not exactly telling you that they're not filing this form, that you're required to file the form. Right. Because that actually happened to me when I was, you know, picking a my own retirement plan. I was like, hey, who filed the, the form 5500? And she was like, um, nobody's asked that before. I was like, yeah, OK, because I know the penalties involved. And so those they, penalties are high, too. They are high. And so, you know, so I was like, if y'all not filing this 5500, I need to go find somebody else, because although I am a tax person, this ain't what I do. OK, I need to go find somebody that's going to file this. I don't care if I got the easy. OK, I don't want no parts of it. So just know that as as a. Um, for your own practice management, when you have your plan, you need to find out who's filing this 5500. So none of us are going to jail or writing checks that we really don't need to write. OK, so let's talk about prohibited transactions. So a prohibited transaction is an improper transaction between a plan and a taxpayer uh, beneficiary or any disqualified person. It's any transaction that's prohibited by law. The main thing here is if you're involved in a prohibited transaction, you're going to pay a tax of 15% of the amount involved each year or part of the year. And if you don't fix it, then you're going to pay 100% of the amount if you don't correct it within that taxable period, okay? So um, in your materials, there is a list of prohibited transactions. There's also a list of who is a disqualified person. Those are the things that you need to know when, uh, when dealing with prohibited transactions in a plan. All right, so I did this quick, what's the difference between, because I was like, what's the difference between the two? Okay, so what's the difference between a defined benefit plan and a defined contribution plan? The defined contribution plan is you will you choose how much you pay, but you don't know how much you're going to get out. With a defined benefit plan, you know what your payout is going to be. So like when you retire from a job that has a pension, if you retire after 25 years, you're going to make this amount per month until you die. With the contribution plan, you're going to put your money into your 401k. And depending on what the market looks like is what's going to determine what your payout is going to be. Right. The value of your of your 401k. So that's the difference between those two plans. What's the difference between an IRA and a 401k? 401ks are employee employer sponsored plans. They have higher contribution limits, and you can usually take out a loan against your 401k plan. There's limits to those loans, but you can take out a loan. An IRA is opened by an individual, usually through a broker or a bank, and there's more investment options with an IRA. So that's the difference between those major types of um, retirement plans. You got Roths, you got all these things, but they're going to fall into the IRA or the 401k bucket. 
they're either going to be a defined contribution plan or a defined benefit plan. And like we talked about, defined benefit plans, those are pensions. Those pensions are going away. Like, because because companies, they could afford them. They just don't want to afford them. Let's just say that. Okay. Which of the following is not considered a prohibited transaction for a qualified plan? Woo, let's see. Leslie uses a self-directed IRA to invest in a 35% owned corporation by a disqualified person. Ted uses his qualified plan funds to lend to an entity controlled and owned by his mother. Shermaine sells an interest in a piece of property owned by her qualified plan to her son. And Rolla personally guarantees a bank loan to his qualified plan to purchase real estate. Hmm. So we know a prohibited transaction involves a disqualified person. And it's also a transaction that is prohibited by law. So now I did not go into any detail about what these prohibited transactions are. So this is going to see how well you can guess. Because uh, listen, you're going to get on this exam and you're going to look at something and go, what? <laughs> so you got to know, you, you got to go by what you know. Some people are saying A, some people are saying C. Some people are switching from C to A. <laughs> All right, somebody, somebody got a D on there. Who wants to volunteer the correct answer? I said D because you can't borrow. Um, I think there was something about not allowed to borrow. You you saying roll up um the fourth one. Roller personally guarantees a bank loan to his qualified plan to purchase real estate. Okay. You saying that's not a prohibited transaction? No, that is prohibited. Oh, oh my God. You gotta <laughs> read. Uh -huh. you gotta <laughs> read. <laughs> yes, yeah. sir. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anybody else want to attempt the correct answer? Okay, so the correct answer is A. Key word on here was the word not. Which of the following is not? considered a prohibited transaction. Make sure you read. All righty. Okay. So um, we are short on time. So um, if you got questions, put those in the group. We're going to talk about this boot camp that we have coming up in Vegas. Hey. Okay. So, so we are right. Um, June 11th through 13th. Um, in just a couple months. So this is the fabulous hotel that Miss Bougie Melinda um, picked out. <laughs> Listen, if anybody's going to up-level your bouge, it is hanging out with Melinda, all right? But this is a fabulous hotel. <laughs> um, and so we have partnered with Fast Forward Academy for the content for this, for you to um, get your EA training. And I think, Melinda, you just put a note in the group for people who have already paid. Their materials are going out this week. Boo, yeah. Look at what I got in the Hey. I'm excited. <laughs> like, I'm taking the test again. Right? This is going to be your Bible. Your Bible. Cancel yeah. your hot girl summer. Cancel your hot boy summer. This is your hot boy and your hot girlfriend right here. Right here. <laughs> so, if you are 
full, um, you will all your your materials will be uh, mailed on Friday, and you'll receive your logins either later today or tomorrow. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so here's what's included. You have all of the review materials uh, access until you pass. Um, the online course for all three parts of the EA exam are available until you pass. You have the study guide um, that's in print that she just showed you, that fabulous book that you can probably use for a booster seat. You've got all these videos and you have a ton of review questions with detailed explanations. That is the one thing that is, that's your money maker right there because it's gonna help you learn how to really read the question and, um, and get what it's asking. So you've got the learning tools where you can study anywhere, you're on your desktop, your mobile. You Of course, you have an online community and you've got the learning materials online with the side-by-side -side view. Um, you know, and so we help you, you know, set the goals and focus, right? That's why she said, cancel your hot girl summer, cancel your hot boy summer, because you need to be focused if you plan to get this done by the end of the year. Um, it's got the IRS forms and publications. You've got flashcards. You ha have us fabulous instructors. Um, <laughs> you've got cheat sheets and the Jeopardy. Listen, Jeopardy is so much fun, y'all. That is like the best thing ever, and especially if you win. You've got um, your our Facebook group. Get a study buddy and listen, hold each other accountable. Hold your feet to the fire. If you're going to meet and study, hold each other's feet to the fire. Um, and we're going to have a cram course in December. If you haven't passed all of the um, parts by then, we'll have um, time for you to regroup because we really want you to get this done by the end of the year. And you can. OK, you really can. Um, there's discounted group rates. You've got the smart bundle. There's, there is so much career opportunity out here for enrolled agents right now. And you are in a community of people. There's mentorship available and, you know, all facets of the, of our business, right? So get registered. All right. So you've got the discounted rate. You've got, um, but the hotel discounted rate is about to go away, isn't it? Isn't the hotel almost full? Yes, we have less than 15 rooms uh, left for okay. the hotel discounted rates. Which means don't play. All right. So, and of course, it's a paid vacay. So even though we are going to be working, there will be play time as well. We're going to be, when we're going to be focused, but you know, you can still get out. All right. So the total investment, $19.95. Okay. That's what it is. Um, all right. Well, that's it. We will see you on the next class and we'll take any questions that you have. Okay. So I have been getting there. questions about, um, what if you're already signed up for fast forward Academy? I'm going to drop my email in the chat. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. That is per person. Let me see. First, I'm going to drop the links that you all need. So the link that I just dropped in the chat, that is publication 560. That's a really good resource to use. And it has all those uh, really nice charts in it for uh, business retirement plans. And definitions, the IRS has a really good page that have all the retirement plans definitions. Um, that's also a really, really good resource because in order to understand the retirement plans questions, you're kind of going to have to understand what plan means. And unfortunately, that's something that you're going to have to remember. Um, so I just dropped those two links that are, are very useful, useful, use those resources. But of course, Fast Forward Academy, um, the materials and what you're going to learn in Vegas along with the cheat sheets, you'll have all of those, um, the charts and everything else you need to know to help you breeze through the business retirement plans. Um, what else did I, oh, if you are already signed up and paid for Fast Forward Academy and you want to attend the boot camp, send me your contact information and um, we'll give you a separate 
pricing if you don't have to have the materials. Um, we talked about the hotel is getting ready to expire. Right now, we do have discounted hotel room rates, um, and the room rates are less than than what the real cost is. So if you want to um, live it up, <laughs> uh, but don't have to pay so much, you need to join us in Vegas. Um, once you pay in full, you'll receive the discount codes for the rooms. And if you are ready to secure your seat in Vegas, I will drop the link for you now. That's the link right there. Um, keep in mind, deadlines are about to end. So if you're serious about becoming an enrolled agent and you need someone to hold you accountable and you need a support system to lean on, support system for me was the number one thing when I was studying because I would get off track or I would get busy um, doing work. I would get discouraged. I was like, man, I don't know this stuff. It's it's gonna make it seem like it's a breeze it's not it's hard and you definitely need a support system if you're anything like me and you didn't have anybody around you that could hold you accountable that's when you reach out to the people that's in our facebook group our, our private facebook groups um i'm trying to see if we have any more questions Jay asks, how long does it take to get through all three parts? That's kind of on you. It depends on how many hours per day you study. Starting out, I would highly recommend you study at least one to two hours a day. That's enough to um, keep you on track, uh, but it's not too much to drain you out. So pick a time that you're going to start studying and do it every day every day but we'll we'll help you create a um a study before we go um to vegas before we'll do it during the orientation because the orientation is going to be virtual so we won't have to uh, do a lot of things when we get to vegas outside of focusing on what you need to know to pass all three parts of the exam Okay, do I have any more questions? I don't see any more questions. You're welcome, Jay. Um, well, if there aren't any more questions, we're looking forward to seeing you all in Vegas. And next week we're talking about, um, I don't know what Doc is, I think Doc is talking about um, fines and penalties for tax practitioners that are uh, trying to practice, but they aren't licensed. I see a lot of those. Um, so we will see you all next week. All right. See y'all in the group.